old German dugout. We do our cooking on a little Primus stove, a wonderful invention which I always expect to explode at any time. Stuart, he is the most pronounced character I've met. We've been close since the beginning. He's been a Northwest Mounted Policeman, and a fur trader, and a Yukon gold digger. He has the vitality and appearance of Hercules, but remains normal by constant undermining operations, such as 50 cigarettes a day and the output of a whiskey factory. On the 14th of March, he was shot while we were withdrawing across the open. The colonel told me to get him in. He was very heavy, and three other men nearly failed. He protested violently and made an awful noise about the pain. The padre asked him if he wished him to pray. Pray like hell, man! Charlie, do you want me to write to anyone? I promised to write to his various sweethearts and finally left him to die in the dressing station. He came back a few days ago, much to my delight. <laughs> I thought that's what all you did. <laughs> in 1914, in Nova Scotia, Will Bird's brother Stephen bade goodbye to his younger brother. Stephen was going off to war, but he made Will a strange promise. If I get killed and you come over, I will find a way to watch over you. One day, the fateful word comes. Stephen is missing, blown to pieces in battle. So Will's brother was killed in action in the war, and so he went off uh, to fight in the war as well. Bird's sleeping in this trench after a long night of working, and he feels this warm hand touch his body, and he looks up, and it's his brother, Stephen. Stephen, what are you doing here? Can you stop? And knowing that his brother, Stephen, is dead, he's just like, what? What, what are you doing here, Stephen? His brother just tells him to be quiet and turns around and keeps on walking. About nine in the morning, some men from his own battalion come and they shake him and they're like, Bird, what are you doing here? Where you been? And he's like, I, oh, I just, how did you know how to get out of that where you were staying? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, we're picking up the pieces of the men that you stay with, the pieces of their body. You know, they, they were blown up. Dear B, your idea that we should meet at a bal masqué rather appeals to me. I wish to play the role of the mysterious soldier, pour out his expiring thoughts and experiences. And you, the role of a friendly woman, somewhat uneasy about my fate, and in spare moments anxious to help me with friendly letters and occasional gifts. Just before turning in, that is, putting on a coat and lying down, I must tell you, you are the best correspondent I've ever had. A dream come true. Hill 62, there you go. My grandfather, Dana, starts off in Zilbeck. You see the farmhouse on the left? Yep. See? And if you just go straight up from that, you'll see the spires there? Yep. In front of that, again, there's a little village, so that's where they are right the there, there in Zilbeck. There's a significant amount of black blood on my grandfather's side. Blacks weren't allowed into the rifle, into the combat arms, because uh, it was a white man's war, and they couldn't be trusted. They were slower, they weren't as smart, and they couldn't be trusted with, uh, with weapons. It was the caricature. Um, of course, in some counties, it had to make up their quotas. It was 
more difficult to make the quota if you didn't accept blacks or people that were close to black into your battalion. And my grandfather's attestation papers, his complexion is described as swarthy, and uh, on his uh, discharge paper it's described as dark. So he manages to live through the Battle of uh, Mount Sorrel itself, and then when they come back into the line after a break, that's when he gets injured. He goes away, convalesces, volunteers to come back, and rejoins his unit on the 6th. Four days after the battle starts, he rejoins his unit, and then, and, uh, and then he's back up here. He's back on the front. Suddenly a shell from nowhere reduces Dana Thompson's mates to small pieces of bloody flesh, to nothingness. <laughs> Dana's medical record says it starkly. On June the 4th, a shell exploded near him, killing several of his comrades and gave him nervous shock. The next document calls it shell shock. This is why I came. This is where it all happened. This is where it all ended as well. My grandfather was a poor man. I came from a hard background, went back to a hard background, suffered from uh, shell shock his entire life, uh, alienated his family, pushed his family away, wouldn't talk about his experiences, was subject to fits of rages, lived with his wounds his entire life, um, lived a very poor, existence very very poor scratching out literally scratching out a living and an existence in rural nova scotia and this is where it all starts i was incredibly proud today reading his war record it mentioned that his wounds were sustained on duty facing the enemy and as a professional soldier i just can't imagine anything more important than to be facing the enemy, doing his job, having come from nothing and going back to nothing. It is very important right now, being here. Jason Prince has been moving in the shadow of his great uncle, John Patrick Tian, dipping into his journal at every spare moment. He has basically given up any hope of, of going home. And he has, I think, opportunities to, to, to leave. Um, and he, and he, he keeps coming back. Right now, I don't quite understand why he's still there. The Australians have a word for it. They call it mateship. And and that's the most important thing. These guys, they might have belonged to a battalion, and certainly the officers, and the men were very, very proud of the fact that they were a certain battalion. But actually, what you're really talking about is their section of men, that little tiny group that they live with, they fight with, they die with, they eat with, everything revolves around a tiny handful of people. Now Jason is searching for something, perhaps a name unmemorial anything to give the shadow some life. This is the Thiepval Memorial, Great Britain's monument to 73,000 soldiers missing from the Battle of the Somme. Though he was a Canadian, Tien rose through the ranks and ended up as an officer with the British Knots and Derby Regiment. Second Lieutenant. On the memorial, his army existence comes down to a single chiseled name on the third line, shadowed by the setting sun, fading after 90 years. Tian, JP. These are the missing, you know. These are the, these are the bodies that are buried somewhere in the ground here that surface occasionally, bones. You just see all these names, but each one of these names is, a, is actually a life, it's a story. It's quite something as I'm reading these diaries. I mean, I've read them before and I helped in the editing process and as I read through them, I'm getting to know this guy, you know. 
Peace out.